The thing is, is that everybody in research understands that every single system in your body can be impacted by hormones. And we've understood that progestin will affect the brain and there aren't changes with the brain. I like to make a joke that your uterus isn't Las Vegas. What happens in the uterus doesn't always stay in the uterus. Progestin <laughs> is one of those. Welcome to the Betty Rocker Show, the place to be to nourish your mind, love your body and rock your life. What's up, rock star? Coach Betty Rocker here. Welcome back. I am so glad you're joining me as we continue to explore topics around women's hormone health. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Jolene Brighton, a prominent leader in women's medicine and the emerging science of post-birth control syndrome, which studies the effects of hormonal birth control on women's health. Dr. Brighton is a fierce patient advocate and completely dedicated to uncovering the root cause of hormonal imbalances. She empowers women worldwide to take control of their health and their hormones. Her work has been featured in the New York Post, Forbes, Cosmopolitan, the Huffington Post, Bustle, The Guardian, and ABC News, to name a few. Dr. Jolene Brighton, come on down. It's so great to have you here. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Uh, <laughs> if you made me laugh too much when I cough, uh, that was a great <laughs> intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, for you, my friend, you are, I feel like you deserve a special introduction because you are such a warrior of women's health. And not only are you a fierce advocate for your patients, you have had your own one crazy ride this last two years. I, I've been following your social media and have just been like, how is this woman not only still hanging in there and taking care of herself, but then continuing to put out this body of work and take care of her patients? Clearly, you have so much grit, Jolene. What's been going on for the past couple of years with you and your health? And how are you taking care of yourself in the midst of this? Because as women, we all go through crazy periods of our lives and you know so much about health. What, what's going oh, on? Man. Yeah, I. So it's what you say. My husband says my superpower is grit. Um, but like, you know, it's important to reflect that purpose, a sense of purpose is really important in health. And, you know, when my son became sick, if people don't know, he has an autoimmune condition that causes inflammation in the brain. Go to YouTube, search pandas, uh, P8, like the, like the teddy bear, you know, but it's not cuddly. Um, search pandas, kids, and you will see a glimpse into what my life was like when that happened. You literally lose your child overnight. And there were times where people were like, just take a break, get off of social media. And I'm like, but this is my purpose. Like my purpose in life is to educate women and to give them medically accurate information that we all should have received about our bodies. This idea of it being gated behind the white coat and only the doctor has this information and then it's withheld from women. They're not given informed consent. Like it's really something that, you know, from my background, if people don't know, I grew up in a very large Hispanic family. Don't trust doctors. Don't, uh, yeah, never go to the doctor. Don't trust the doctor. The, you know, if you don't know the history of birth control, I mean, the stories were told to me by my family of how, you know, um, so Puerto Rico is where the first trials began. There was no informed consent. Women died. And so it's really like when I look back at like the family I grew up in, of course, I became a naturopathic physician because if my, like, you know, being the conventional that, that when we grew up, that wasn't the safe person to go to. And so, you know, in all of that, I look at how much I didn't know, how much my family didn't know, and how much fear there was in decisions, fear-based decisions I made. I mean, like, I make a joke that if you look at a Latina, we'll get pregnant. Like, that's <laughs> my, my family's huge. I mean, I, they just assumed I was infertile because I didn't have a baby until I was 30. My mom had me when she was 16. Like, and so, you know, in all of that, I was really scared. I needed to go on birth control. I was scared of my heavy, painful periods. I was scared of getting pregnant. 
And this has been true for a lot of my patients. And so it's been very much my mission to remove the fear by giving accurate education, holding a space that you can question what's true for you. You can choose differently than what your doctor says, what your mother says, what your friend says. Like you can, there is no right and wrong here. It's about what is true for you, what's best for you. So that's really kept me going with you know, my son developing pandas, then rolling into me having COVID. And oh, when I saw that, oh my gosh, Jolene, and I, those pictures of you in the hospital, and you, I mean, you had it bad. You, you didn't just have some mild case of COVID. You were, I mean, you were knocked out by it. And I, and I was, I just was really struck by your, just, you're always so authentic. You have so much grit, like you like your husband says, and I, I say too. But you know what? One of the things that you you called out in your stories as you were sharing about having COVID was like, look, doctors can get COVID, and you know, there's this expectation sort of of this like, oh, if you if you're a doctor, you know all the things to do to protect yourself, but you're also a human being who can mm -hmm. catch a you know catch a, this virus. And it's tell us what happened, how you how you've been recovering. You know, it's really funny. There's a video that um, I recorded in February um, and it's going to go up on YouTube, but it's ha I've kept making it go back through edits because I don't want to send the wrong message. And in February, record this video and I am like, we're not worried about COVID. I'll be in that 80% who gets it, maybe sick a little bit, probably doesn't even notice. I'm healthy. I'm in my 30s. Like, um, I didn't want to put that video out because without me, I'm like, you guys, we have to make fun of me a little bit in this of like, this is silly. And this is wrong. This is this is what we believe to be true in February. But look at how I was like, I eat right, I exercise, I was so confident because I had done all of this lab work in the beginning of the year, my organs, my inflammation, uh, everything looked great. Just a couple of weeks, coincidentally, before getting my uh, getting symptoms, developing symptoms, I had done a Dutch, a complete Dutch panel. So that's so people who don't know, that's a comprehensive hormone test. It looks at your estrogen, your estrogen metabolites, your progesterone, your testosterone, DHT, which is a form of testosterone. That if you got too much of it, you're going to lose your hair, get acne. It also looks at other metabolites, um, so like uh, vitamin metabolites, like B12, B6, and it looks at stress hormones. So when I was really sick, people were like, "Well, your vul vulnerability must be all the stress." Like your kid developed pandas, and then your book came out, and I was like, "Yeah, that's what it is." But when I started to get better, I went and looked at that Dutch panel, and my stress hormones were fine. And my DHEA, my cortisol was fine. And my progesterone was awesome. And we'll talk about why that's significant that no, stress wasn't the only factor. So I actually didn't believe that I would get COVID um, the way I did. I was, uh, I, am, I still am. I mean, even six weeks after being in the hospital, we, we ran blood work and I look amazing on paperwork. My, my organs are optimal. Everything's optimal. And I'm like, and I get these labs back while I'm still in oxygen therapy at home, fatigued, unable to really walk around. And I'm like, how does someone look this good on paper? But these are the symptoms. And it just really highlights for me that diet and lifestyle are essential but they're not going to protect you from the humanness of being a human, which is getting sick, but they absolutely can impact outcomes because my doctors have told me you probably would have died. If you were not this healthy, you probably would have died. And that really, I mean, there was, there was a good three weeks where I thought I was going to die. And I'll tell you how you reprioritize everything in life when you think you're going to die. Um, but you know, for your listeners, cause they're definitely going to be very much like that cohort of diet and exercise. I want to say it is really important, but I think what's so important about that message is, is that if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, if you have endometriosis, if you have a chronic condition, it's not your fault. You don't have to feel shame. People often come in, like people will say to, you know, if you have cancer, they'll say, Oh, well, if you had eaten better, like 
that's not what people need to hear. And also the way I've always reframed it for my patients, because they've done this in one-on-one is, and what if you hadn't? Like, what would it look like if you hadn't been taking such great care for yourself, of yourself? And so this is such an opportunity for us all to sit back and say, these things are essential, but the human body is not perfect. Right. And, and you, you're, you make such an excellent point that the resilience that we're able to help develop in ourselves as a result of taking care of those, what we call it, the Betty Rocker, the four pillars of health. We, we go on sleep, nutrition, stress management, and exercise just as our, our foundation. Um, it's, it does provide you with a great amount of resilience. It doesn't mean that you're not going to still deal with sickness, illness, hormone imbalances, but having that resilience is it's just like, it's, it's like, it's like having an extra bank account, like having that, those reserves you can draw from when you don't know you're going to need them. So I really appreciate you making that point and, and everything that you talk about, um, when it comes to our hormone health, which you've started to touch on here a little bit, is just so fascinating to me. And the woman's body is just so amazing. It's so amazing. So would you help sort of demystify a little bit, just give us a little crash course in the hormones and some of the things that happen in our bodies throughout our lifetime. I know that that could be a whole dissertation probably, but what comes to mind if you were to say, okay, let me just educate you about your hormones a little bit, ladies. It's a whole book called Beyond the Pill. That's right. (laughs) That's right. right. That's the best book. Yeah. Well, thank you. And there's actually a whole chapter in the book just to understanding the superpowers that your hormones give you, often the narrative uh, that women have received, I mean, even you see this in just on TV, is that your body's betraying you with these hormones and periods are awful and it's just not true. So, you know, to understand that the way that you have estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, what is called your sex hormones um, that come from your ovaries, the way that you have adrenal hormones being produced, and all of this is orchestrated by your brain. So that's really just important to understand that is your brain communicating to your body. And there's a whole feedback system where it's like, if you've got too much estrogen, the brain says, okay, we need to slow our roll on this. Like we don't need, we don't need this much estrogen to keep you safe. So if we go through a typical menstrual cycle, um, and even if you're someone who's like, I don't have periods anymore, still pay attention. These things are important to know. So you know, the start of your menstrual cycle, day one, first day that you have bleeding, that's when your hormones drop to their lowest. So to set off the shedding of the uterine lining known as the endometrium, your hormones are going to drop, estrogen and progesterone. They do that in response to not detecting a fertilized egg being present. So that begins day one of your cycle. But while your uterus is shedding its lining, your ovaries are getting ready to ovulate. So this is why in medicine, it's called the follicular phase altogether. Uh, you'll hear people say, oh, your period is separate from your follicular phase. That's a fourth phase. True for the uterus, not true for the ovaries. And so there's nothing wrong with it. It's just to know there's a difference there. So even while you're having your period around day two, three, four, the brain starts signaling with follicle stimulating hormone, FSH. It gets an egg ready so that you can ovulate. Then you go into the ovulatory phase. Now, leading up to that, if you are not on hormonal birth control, you might notice that your lips get plump, you get curvy, you also get in the mood. And that is mama nature being really wise because sperm can live five to six days. So if five days before ovulation, you want to engage in intercourse and you will actually collect some sperm and you'll have a better chance of getting pregnant. Why is that happening? Because estrogen and testosterone are rising. So estrogen, while she gets vilified and we can talk about problems with estrogen, this is why we have great skin. We have less fine lines and wrinkles. We have plumpness to our lips, our breasts, our hips. This is what is the feminizing hormone. And, you know, so she's rising and that what's going to happen is that estrogen is going to spike, then luteinizing hormone is going to spike, which is also known as LH. And you might know that from LH test strips on Amazon, if you're trying to get pregnant, and then an egg is going to be released. 
But in that time leading up to it, testosterone is also rising, which is going to be your libido. But that's also our mood as women. It influences our mood heavily, our muscle mass. I mean, testosterone is really important for women. So those are the key players in the beginning. After you ovulate, what's left behind in the ovary is the corpus luteum. You must ovulate to make progesterone because this is where progesterone comes from. What you find in an IUD, a depo shot, the pill, any of these synthetic hormones is progestin. It is not the same thing. So understand women are often like, I don't want to ovulate. I don't want to get pregnant. If you want to feel chilled out, and calm, have a less anxiety, get really good sleep. Um, You know, if you want to basically fill in love with your life, you want to be ovulating because that's what progesterone does for you. That takes you through the luteal phase. And then when the hormones drop, we start our period. And so to understand, uh, when you understand those basics, you can take that information, apply it to a teenage period that's starting for the first time. By the way, those are like hit and miss. They're not always, um, they're not always predictable. And that's just brain and ovaries figuring out. You can also apply this to perimenopausal transition and then menopause. Like, why is it that I'm starting to have more wrinkles? I feel like my skin is aging more rapidly. Yes, there's other hormones that could be involved, but it may very well be that estrogen's dropping. Or why am I suddenly at 48 having panic attacks and insomnia? It's likely you're not ovulating and you're not getting your progesterone. Mm, Thank you for explaining that so well, because it really does form the baseline and foundation of what we need to understand, like you said, for our entire life cycle. And then when we get into things that really throw those things out of balance when we're trying to use birth control, um, synthetic birth control, specifically not natural birth control methods, which I hope we'll talk about too. I know that you and I have both had the experience. I know this because I've read about it on your book and I've read about it on your amazing website, which has so many great resources, guys. Please check out Dr. Brighton's website, which we'll link to in the show notes. You talked about when you got, you were put on the pill and mm-hmm. um, I, I, I just have read uh, that, you know, you, you were dealing with acne, you had really painful periods. And then what else happened after, once you got on it and got off it? Yeah. Well, I actually started birth control. My doctor was like heavy, painful periods. So I was bleeding seven plus days of the month that went on for years. You bled through so many of my clothes. Um, th- but you guys, this was when wearing overalls with the suspenders down was it was a st- in style and tying sweat- sweatshirts around your waist was like a fashion statement <laughs> that saved me. I'm like, if I was not a kid of the 90s, this would have been way worse. Um, uh, so, you know, th- my doctor was like, this will fix your periods. You don't even have to have them if you don't want and you won't get pregnant. And I was like, sign me up. I actually never had acne issues until I came off of it. And that's when I had cystic acne. The worst part that I remember, and I know you will definitely understand this, is I was a, I worked my way through college as a group fitness instructor. And they would have these platforms we'd stand on. And I'd have like all of this cystic acne that I could hide and cover up a lot of the time. Uh, and so if people can't see, I just pointed underneath my jawline. Um, and... I would stand on that platform and everybody was looking up and could see it. And then you like put cover up on and then you sweat and then you wipe. Oh, it's just like, it was, it was so, and it was, um, you know, it was important for me to go through because until you go through some of this stuff, you, you don't really understand how it messes with your mind so much. It's not just about like, Oh, I have painful cystic acne. It's also that, I don't want to show up in any photos. I don't want photos taken of me. I don't, I don't want to go to this thing because like, you start socially isolating in some ways because you're like, I don't want anyone to see my face right now. Well, and speaking of socializing, it's, uh, I read also that you had like horrible mood swings after. Oh God, yes. Yeah, you were just really struggling with. Uh, I, yeah, and the aftermath of this was just really, really challenging. Um, you, you had yeah. you, you didn't, your period became irregular, I read, or you didn't mm-hmm. have a period. 
Well, and that's the thing of like, I lost my period in like what's called post pill amenorrhea. I had acne. My doctor said, Oh, you just, you just have a uh, PCOS. You've always had it. And I was like, no, because my, and I was in natural Valley medical school at the time. And I was like, no, I don't have blood sugar issues. I don't have the diagnose, diagnostic criteria of PCOS. And I never had irregular periods like, you know, before I got on the pill. So I had started my period at 14 ages 15 and 16. I, when you count your period down like doomsday, like, you know, when it's coming, cause I was in so much pain. I <laughs> like, this is, this is how old I am guys. Um, I would plug the electric heating pad into the wall and it was such a short cord. I had to lie on the kitchen floor with it and I would sometimes vomit. Like it was so, so bad. So oh, when this- I told my doctor, I'm not misremembering my period. He, he told me he was gaslighting me and being yeah. like, you don't know your body. This dismissal of women from their doctors is so mm. common. I hear about it all the time. And this is why, thank goodness, you are here and doing the work that you're doing. And one of my, one of the things that I read that I really appreciated that you said in the book is sort of like, you know, when you're on the pill, it's like your ovaries and your brain stop being able to talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And then when you get and so it's like a disconnect, like that you, you used a great analogy of a cell phone signal that gets like disconnected. And yeah. then when you get off of the pill, you are, it's sometimes hard for the body to reestablish that connection. Mm-hmm. And I really related to your story personally. And I'm sure a lot of other women can too. I, I got on the pill at 14 um, just because I wanted to prevent unwanted pregnancy. I was, you know, sexually active young. And, um, I was on it for 14 years and didn't understand during that period until close to when I got off of it, that my violent mood swings, that the common weight fluctuations I experienced, that a lot of those symptoms I was having while I was on the pill were in part caused by the pill. And then when I got off of it, I got, I just started to feel intuitively wrong for taking Mm -hmm. it and was more educated at that age about other methods to use and was more in tune with my body as a woman. And I developed a polyp on my um, uterus that had to be surgically removed, like within months of getting off of it. And also experienced just a lot of other issues that happened within a period of five years to do with my adrenals, my gut Mm -hmm. health, um, other things that as I read your book, I was just like, wow, I wonder how much 14 years of pill use, how long of an impact that really had on my entire system over the years. You know, I've had thyroid issues. I've had obviously all of these compounding issues that sort of, you know, your your hormones, like you said in the beginning, they talk to each other. So... Mm -hmm. It's so interesting, and I know that we're not alone in our experience. So many women have had to deal with these these things. And um, talk to us more about how the pill disrupts our natural internal systems. Yeah, and you know, just to echo what you said is the you know the questioning of what is fourteen years. So I spent ten years on it. I don't regret being a first generation college student and I don't regret um, becoming a doctor, which the pill was a tool to help me do that. Um, And yet I do question the same thing. And what really has struck me and really has motivated me in my work is that I spent 10 years on the pill and it wasn't until I got into medical school that I was taught how the pill works and how my menstrual cycle worked, how my body worked. And I just remember sitting there thinking, you shouldn't have to go to medical school to understand how the body you live in works. And you should, like, if you're given this medication, you should understand how it works. So with, uh, so the most prominent birth control is the pill. It's been around since the 1950s, really became much more ubiquitous in the 1960s. And with that, how it works is it's a large enough dose of hormones that when you take it orally, your liver does a crack at processing it. Um, and you know, it's, it's absorbed. Most of it is absorbed in the small intestine, but does make its way into your large intestine. So it can mess with the microbiota, the flora of your gut. But when you absorb it, it, is that feedback mechanism. It tells your brain we have enough hormones, shut it down. So do not talk to the ovaries. 
don't stimulate them to make hormones. Now, that's the primary mechanism by which it stops you from ovulating. However, there are some backup mechanisms to it where it thins the lining of your uterus. So if you did ovulate, that egg wouldn't be able to implant. It also thickens cervical mucus. So that's something that progestin does specifically. And so sperm can't make its way to the egg. In, you know, this is the way these things should work in theory. And it's important to understand that, you know, even in our lifetime, we were told that like the progestin IUDs stayed localized and that they never affect any other system in your body. Now, what's interesting is you talk to people doing research. Dr. Sarah Hill is a great example. And she's she wrote a book, uh, This Is Your Brain on Birth Control. And her and I have had conversations and she's like, the thing is, is that everybody in research understands that every single system in your body can be impacted by hormones. And we've understood that progestin will affect the brain and there aren't changes with the brain. Um, I like to make a joke that your uterus isn't Las Vegas. What happens in the uterus doesn't always stay in the uterus. And progestin <laughs> is one of those. Um, I, I did get to actually speak on a stage in Vegas and say that. And it was like my proudest moment. I was like, my joke <laughs> is happening in Vegas. You're killing uh, it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, who's going to hire me for stand-up comedy? Bring this <laughs> medicine stuff. Um, but with that, it's just really interesting because researchers acknowledge this. They also acknowledge that research studies cherry pick a population, a young, healthy population to put on birth control. And then they have like, here's generally what happens. And then when they're the, and then they expect outliers. But for some reason, when it gets into medicine, doctors are like, whatever you're saying, unless there's a study to back it up is just not true. And whatever you, you know, if there's not a study, so this went on for a really long time with mood symptoms like you had. I mean, I, I have my own mood symptoms on birth control and lots of my patients have. Women have, like, here's the thing. How do we know what questions to ask or what to research? We listen to women. And when you've got thousands of women, I mean, this is the great thing about the internet. They all took to the internet and started to share their stories. And it's like, mm -hmm. hold up. All of these women around the world are saying the same thing and they don't know each other, but yet doctors are lining up to dismiss any correlation with mood. We can't say causation. I want to be clear. We, it's going to be hard to say causation um, because birth control impacts so many systems. How do you say that birth control directly caused mood symptoms? But even in 2016, as I point out in the book, when the research study came out showing over a million women were followed, they found a correlation between birth control new diagnosis of depression and the prescription of a uh, antidepressant drug. So it wasn't just like, mm, let's get you in counseling. It was, this is bad enough. We need to give you a drug. And this was in Denmark. They're not as prescription happy as some clinicians can be in the United States. But that study came out and doctors lined up to say, nope, still in women's heads, still not true. And this, this is correlation. It's not causation. So let's just not talk about it. And that's the problem. We have to listen to women. We have to be humble enough to admit when we get it wrong. And we have to talk about it. You don't have to be, you know, people are like, this is their favorite thing. Dr. Brayton's questioning birth control. She's anti-birth control. I'm like, could you get more basic in your reasoning? I'm not saying birth control is bad. I'm saying if like you are getting, you're on it, you're being prescribed it, you should know about this. Here's when to talk to your doctor and know that if it doesn't work for you, you're not broken. You're not the problem. Like you need to change prescriptions. Yes. And I love this because I, I read that in, in your book and I was so, it, it, you know, you talk about how you're, you're not anti birth control, the, not anti the pill. You're, you're, you're pro informed consent when we're going into taking something that is being prescribed to us by our doctor informed. This is everything. Mm -hmm. And then empowered to speak up and advocate for ourselves. So understanding how our cycle works, how it should work optimally. And then that helps us understand when it's being disrupted by something like synthetic hormones or the pill. And I think that's just really, really great information. One thing that you talk a lot about in the book is thyroid health, and I am so glad that you talked about that. I think that a lot of the times we're so focused on like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, we're looking at those hormones specifically. Um, 
how does our thyroid get impacted by those those hormones and and how should it function optimally? Mm-hmm. So if people don't know what thyroid hormone is, there's a little butterfly shaped gland at the front of your neck and it releases thyroid hormone in response to thyroid stimulating hormone. So TSH is what your brain says to your thyroid. Your thyroid releases inactive and a little bit of active thyroid hormone. Inactive is T4, active is T3, but most inactive that thyroid hormone has to get converted. And that's usually in the gut, the liver, the kidneys, peripheral organs, so outside of the thyroid. And this is your mood, your metabolism, your menses, your gut motility. So too much or too little thyroid hormone can throw off every system in the body because every cell has a receptor for it. It's absolutely essential. So when we have weight gain, hair loss, brain fog, fatigue, we can't poop, our skin is really dry, these kinds of things. And there's checklists in the book. So if anybody's like, I want to, I'm, I'm a big fan of checklists. So like, okay, when, because when you know what is, what you can identify as a problem, you can take that to your provider and say, nope, I have these symptoms and I want to be have this investigated and you can have a more productive conversation. Side note, your quiz, your little quiz in the book, the self-identifying quiz going through like A to F, I think of like the questionnaire. Mm -hmm. So cool. Really, really helpful. All the checklists. Love them. I'm glad that that was helpful. And, you know, in in the thyroid chapter, I tried to really drive home the difference between hypo and hyperthyroid. Hyperthyroid is way less common. So most people get less left out of the conversation with it. And I wanted to include that so they know what to look for with that as well. But with thyroid hormone, what you have to understand is that it also interacts with cortisol, estrogen, progesterone as some examples. And progesterone helps you utilize thyroid hormone hormone at the cellular level. Whereas progestin, we have no evidence that it's a, it helps at all. Let me just say, so if you're not ovulating because you're mm-hmm. on the pill and you told us earlier that ovulation is important because that's when we release the progesterone, mm-hmm. well, that must really have an impact on the thyroid hormones. It's part, it's in part why we see more hypothyroidism developing postmenopausal. So perimenopause to postmenopausal. The other piece is that estrogen and progesterone and testosterone are really significant players with your immune system. Testosterone actually helps regulate interleukins, which are responsible for creating inflammation. So understand that this may be in part, so hormonal birth control affects gut health, which is where it can be a source of inflammation. It affects your testosterone. And so that is responsible for helping regulate inflammation. It's also like, a lot of estrogen with unchallenged progesterone. It doesn't have that challenged progesterone. So all of those interact with the immune system as well. And why that's important is because the number one cause of hypothyroidism within developed nations is autoimmune in origin, and it predominantly affects women. You're, you know, last estimates I saw, you're five to eight times more likely to develop hypothyroidism once you're getting into your 30s. So like once you're getting like 35 plus, which is when some some women are going into perimenopause. Mm-hmm. So to understand there's this interplay with the immune system, autoimmunity means your cells attack your own tissues. In this case, it's the thyroid. But in addition, all that inflammation makes it so you can't actually use thyroid at the cellular level either. I mean, you can't use insulin uh, if your cell's totally inflamed. Right. And insulin is such an important thing for all of us to understand and to, to basically, I want to honor my insulin. I want to mm-hmm. honor my pancreas, right? And my liver and all of these important organs that that do so much to regulate like how we're feeling every single day and, and ultimately how our appearance is on the outside too. Everything's mm-hmm. coming from inside of us. So that's why I talk a lot about when it comes to honoring, how can you honor yourself with food, with stress reduction techniques, with sleep, like with exercise? How can you do those things in a self-loving way? Because your mm-hmm. body is listening to you at a cellular level. It, it hears you. It's listening. Um, and I mean, I know that's pretty basic, but I, I feel like you, you talk- No, it's, it's really important. And I want to say in the wake of body positivity movement really coming along, which I appreciate those conversations. And at the same time, I like to remind women that you can love yourself exactly where you are in this moment. However, if you are rapidly gaining or losing weight, 
that is a sign that something is off. And so just to recognize that you can love yourself and we're going to continue to have this weight discussion because it is one metric for which we gauge your health. And so, um, which is also for your audience, if you are someone, I've had patients with eating disorders who are very triggered by stepping on the scale you tell the doctor very clearly, and this is what I say to my patients, you're going to step on backwards and I'm not going to tell you that number. Like, unless you ask me specifically and, and your doctor or the nurse, they should make no comments. And I say this because I have been in enough clinical rotations where people are like, I mean, someone gets on the scale and the nurse is like, Oh, getting, you know, eating a little too much lately, huh? Or they say something like, uh, you know, Oh, spending more time on the couch than usual. And, and it's like, they say this thing of like, and it's a way of saying like, just so be objective. It's an, okay. That's a metric. The metric has changed. Now we have questions to ask, like, but these kind of this commentary, yeah, does that happen to men? So inappropriate. It's so yeah. inappropriate. And, and it's also really damaging to, to mm-hmm. our psyche. And, and it comes as this, and this is the, my issue with the, the number on the scale too, is it comes as this sort of like blanket number. It's not yeah. telling us the actual metrics about our body composition that I think are so crucial to understand, because if you're losing muscle mass, and gaining mm-hmm. body fat rapidly. That's a really important metric or composition ratio to know because it's a symptom that something is going on probably with your hormones. And mm-hmm. if, if you are uh, gaining muscle and losing body fat, that's also interesting to know. And that might not yeah. show up on the number on the scale in the way that you expect, right? Like you could have put on a lot of muscle recently and mm-hmm. lost body fat. And if the nurse is making a comment to you about, oh, you've been spending more time on the couch, your weight went up, it gives you this it could give you a complex about, oh, what am I doing wrong? I need to start starving myself all of a sudden. And it's, it's just, yeah. it's just so limited in scope mm-hmm. of what it's actually telling you. It's, uh, that's so true. And, uh, you know, when I was getting, uh, when I was studying uh, my master's in nutrition, my research work was in sarcopenic obesity. And that is for people who don't know when your muscle cells get deleted and fat cells come in and they're just like, I'm going to infiltrate everything. And you are higher risk for morbidity, mortality, and things like osteoporosis as well. Like, and so to understand that in that segment of the population, this is what, uh, you know, we would talk about the M&M body, like those, the, the round M&M guy who's very, very round, but has skinny legs and arms. That's what that sarcopenic obesity looks like on the scale or on their BMI. They are rarely, if ever, in the obese category or a red flag pop problematic, yet their body composition is very problematic. And because so, sarcopenia you know, means something... muscle wasting, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So this is something that I want to say to people, like I, like in, you know, what I'm telling you about, I mean, so many of these things, just to understand that like, I didn't arrive here because like, I'm some genius person. I arrived to so much of this by listening to my patients and listening to what people say and the feedback that they give me. And when, you know, my first patient said, I can't see that scale number. I can't get on the scale. It will, it's a trigger and it will throw me back into ED, eating disorder. And that first time I heard that, I was like, tell me more about this. Like I need to understand this as a doctor. And so I want women to understand that in advocating for yourself, yes, there's going to be, there's every profession has those people who they're not going to listen to. They're not going to change. But when you do advocate for yourself, as much as it can feel like work and difficult for you, you just made it easier for the next person. Like you just made it easier for the next person to not have to advocate as hard. And that is how we change women's medicine. It won't come from me going around. I mean, I teach doctors, but still it's going to come from the patients who demand that provider does better and they actually advocate for themselves. Oh, I love it that you just said that because look at we're all here to look out for each other as women, as humans, as women, especially because we face unique challenges when it comes mm-hmm. to our health, our reproductive rights, all of these types of, of issues that affect our bodies specifically. So I just love that you brought that up. 
Now, I don't want to miss out on talking a little bit about what happens beyond the pill, specifically. What happens when you get off of the pill? What are some Mm -hmm. of the issues that, we've touched on this a little bit, but what are some of the issues that you see and um, what are some of the recommendations that you have for women who are thinking about maybe transitioning off the pill um, and and, and maybe once they've gotten off the pill, what should they be doing? What are some Mm -hmm. of your insights on that? Of course. And as you said, we have alluded to post-birth control syndrome, which is the collection of signs and symptoms that come about typically four to six months on average, women will experience these. Some experience them sooner, some uh, experience them later. And for people who don't know, a syndrome in medicine is essentially a collection of symptoms that can and and signs that can roll together. So irritable bowel syndrome is one Mm -hmm. where people understand the most where they're like, oh, constipation, diarrhea, like gas, bloating, those things can also come up after you come off of birth control. As you were saying, um, developing a polyp, so polyps, fibroids, fibrocystic breast, um, heavy bleeding, basically growths, anything that's a growth of the tissue can be, if you come off of hormonal birth control and your body doesn't get back to ovulating regularly, you don't have progesterone to challenge. And listen, you're not broken if it takes your body a minute to figure this out, okay? Like, I mean, me, 10 years on the pill, 10 years of my brain and ovaries not communicating. I mean, two of those years, I was like, I don't have to have a period if I don't want to. I thought I was this liberated woman. Um, And like, so it, it took several months for my brain and ovaries to figure out how to dance again. But if you don't have ovulation established, you can still, so women, so understand that when you stop the pill, that initial bleed is a medication induced withdrawal bleed. You have not had a period the entire time you were on it. And when you come off of birth control, then that is a medication induced withdrawal bleed. It's after that first one you have to monitor. This is true for the patch, the Nuva ring. The depot shot is going to wear off over time with a Marina IUD or any like Skyla Kylina, the progestin based IUDs you may still ovulate while on it. So some women continue to ovulate and that's that mechanism of progestin where it thins the endometrial lining and it thickens the cervical mucus so that if sperm did make, so try to block sperm, but if sperm still makes it to the egg, the IUD makes it a hostile environment, so to speak, or incompatible with implantation. So some women will still ovulate. So it may look different for you when you come, when you have the IUD taken out. So just to understand that it can take a bit and as your estrogen is unchallenged, it can stimulate tissues like your breast, your uterus, issues, tissues that are primed, um, your brain, which can, you know, estrogen is important for protecting us against dementia and Alzheimer's, but it also can make you really irritable if there's too much of it. Um, the acne is a really common one. Um, and in the book, I outline that I have a shorter article on drbrighton.com that goes through like post birth control acne, what to do about it. That one, you know, I wanted to get out to women because it's one of the most common reasons I see women go back on birth control. Mm. And then of course there's all the other hormonal chaos. So what's going on with your thyroid, your insulin, your adrenal glands, uh, your oxytocin, it can cause sexual, I hate this word, sexual dysfunction is what it's called in medicine, but it's really sexual adaptation. Like like when we don't want to have sex, it's usually because something is happening internally or externally in the environment. That's like, yo, it's not a good time for a baby. So understand that. um, I just don't like that word because you're not dysfunctional. Your body is adapting as it should. Should. The question is why? So some women develop pain, um, you know, pain with sex, uh, low libido, and that doesn't always come back right after birth control. So this is super, super helpful. So it's understanding a little bit about post birth control syndrome. Mm-hmm. And would you now talk a little bit about some of your guidance around how women should support themselves getting off of the pill or if they've gotten off of the pill? Are mm-hmm. there what are there and, and even if they're on the pill and planning to stay on yeah. the pill like because that's totally a valid option right and as mm-hmm. long as they're 100. informed about the risks and um are there nutrition protocols you recommend are there specific lifestyle habits you recommend are there uh 
I guess I wanted to ask about supplements as well, because they're very accessible to a lot of us. What yeah. general guidance do you have for us you know, before we go read your book, if we haven't read the fabulous book yet. Totally. Um, yeah, because like when you start hearing this, you're like, well, I want to do something about yep, it. So, I sure do. <laughs> um, and you know, my, well, my first degree was in chemistry. I'm such a nerd. Uh, and then I got a second degree. My next degree was in nutrition, specifically nutrition science. So it's always food first with me. And that is something that I want people to understand that, your diet can have such a great impact. And there is a whole um, dietary protocol in the book. If you are vegan or vegetarian, you do you. If that's where your body feels best, you know, I personally am like, we, you know, I personally eat meat. I have seen patients, they need high quality amino acids coming in. You really have to pay attention to protein for blood sugar regulation. And that's how your liver actually detoxifies um, and uses amino acids. So, but I've had people write me and they're like, what if I'm a vegetarian? I'm like, if that works for your body, honor that. Like, just honor where you're at. This is not meant to be diet dogma. Um, and really the focus is let's bring in as much vegetables as we can. Mm -hmm. So lots of vegetables. So if you, when you sit down to eat, if you take your plate, make half of it vegetables, you've got another half, go ahead and split it in half again. You've got protein and then having your carbohydrates in there and your fat, it's going to be a tablespoon or two. Now you will be at different places in your cycle. So your luteal phase, for example, uh, about the week, two weeks before your period, your insulin sensitization changes. This is because your body's like, we might be pregnant. Let's get our, let's get a little bit of weight gain on. So a little bit, nothing extreme, but you'll crave more carbs. And that's not unusual. That's not that you're like this bad person who fell off some bandwagon. This is because you're a cyclical creature and this is how you work. So with that, it might be that you're like eating, you know, you can get sweet potatoes in. I love that. Cause then we've got like great nutrient. We want to choose nutrient dense foods, but that might shift. You might find that, you know, around ovulation, you want to eat more protein and you want to bring down the carbohydrates. And then, you know, as you get closer to your period, you're wanting to bring up your carbohydrates. Like, listen, there are no serving sizes in my book. And that drove some people crazy. And I'm like, look, I spent a good decade net, like weighing and looking at food and it made me neurotic. And uh, that's when I was like, I was working as a nutritionist and I realized it didn't work for people. And also that kind of dogma, it circumvents your own intuition about what your body needs. And then you feel like, Oh, I have to eat this much protein. And your body's like, but I, I really need like, can you eat some berries? Like your body, we don't understand how your body's interacting with food in the environment. Like we're just like very simplistic where we're like calories and nutrients. And yet there is this communication with your body that the environment's safe and like that it's, it's helping your microbiota flourish. So in eating lots of fibrous uh, and, and leafy greens and all these vegetables, you're also going to be supporting liver detoxification. Your liver has to detox that pill and also your own natural hormones. And it's a must to get the right kind of metabolites. So cruciferous vegetables can be great for this. Um, if you have gas bloating issues with cruciferous vegetables whole, broccoli sprouts. If you live in a food desert or there is just not access to these things, broccoli sprouts. Because... A fourth a cup of broccoli sprouts equals about 2.2 uh, pounds of broccoli in terms of the benefits wow. that it can provide. Yeah, especially with estrogen and protection. And you can buy a seed pack for like 79 cents and sprout it. It's just a super economical way to overall support your hormones, support your gut health. Um, and so those are those are some of the things you want to be thinking about. So we want to start with that food first. And if you wow. want a quick start to this, yes. drbrighton.com slash PBCS diet. I've actually got a, a quick one day meal plan to give you a sense of like, how do I get this started? And then I will follow up. There will be emails that come through that are giving you more supportive information. Because like the reality is, not everyone can buy my book. I know that. You might be able to get it at the library. Those are still a thing, guys. Um, so if you can get it at the library, but if like if you're just like, this this is not going to work for me, I still want to support you. Whether you're on birth control, you're coming off of it. But knowing that nutrient density, we 
hormonal birth control can deplete things like magnesium, zinc, selenium, B vitamins, CoQ10, vitamin C. You got to have your diet dialed in and you probably are going to need to have some supplements as well just to help overcome that and to help address whatever you have going on personally. Oh, I'm so grateful for this amazing information. You mentioned broccoli and seeds. You have this really cool thing in your book that we actually did a blog post on to follow up because we think it's so cool about seed mm -hmm. cycling. No one talks about this. Seed cycling is such an interesting and natural way to support your hormones throughout the course of the month. How does it work? Oh, man. Right. I have to just share with you that. So I've been seed cycling for like over 10 years now. Um, I just, it's a really easy practice that I love. And, but uh, with, with the pandemic, they've been out of, I haven't been able to get pumpkin seeds. I, my husband just brought home pumpkin seeds yesterday. He's like, I found raw pumpkin seeds. I'm like, oh my God, that's amazing. I had no um, idea. I would have mailed you some, Dr. Brighton. <laughs> <laughs> done that. What's interesting, there's a lot of places you can get um, flax seeds and uh, sesame seeds. But yeah, well, let's talk about it because people are like, what are you talking about? Why does it even matter? So uh, seed cycling is the idea of working with and uh, supporting your body utilizing seeds. A, seeds are really economical and nutrient dense. <laughs> I lived on these through college. Um, and so with it, you start off the follicular phase. So day one through 14, you're going to have flax seeds and pumpkin seeds. And ground flax seeds are better because you're not a cow and it's hard for you to break them down and digest them. So you want to liberate what you have there. And fresh ground is even better for the fats it can provide. But if you can't get fresh ground and you're like, this is what I'm working with, know that the lignans and fibers can still support you. Mm. So you're going to eat two tablespoons of each during the follicular phase and till you get to ovulation. We always say days one through 14, but real talk guys, you might ovulate on day 10 or you might ovulate on day 18. So follow your body. And then once you ovulate, you flip into sesame seeds and sunflower seeds. And again, you want to grind, especially those sesame seeds. And if you're like, those are gross, I'm there with you. I'm not a tahini person. I am not a sesame seed person, but I just suck it up. I have patients who they'll just put a couple of tablespoons in their mouth and then just chug it with water. I'm like, that's hardcore. How about a I smoothie? Use, just put them yeah. in a smoothie. Put them in a, that's what I do. Put them in a smoothie. I'll put them on top of a salad, yeah. um, you know, use them in different ways. And so um, I have a whole article on drwritten.com that goes even deeper than the book. Um, funny enough, that article was what got cut out of the book. <laughs> and I was like, well, I already wrote it. They cut it out. Um, Bonus chapter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, let me just put it on drbrayton.com. We'll make it accessible to everyone. And so um, I talk about what we know in the research, what's lacking in the research. Not a lot of people want to go research seed cycling because like you can't make a lot of money. Like research studies are expensive and the return on investment just isn't there because again, they're really cheap. <laughs> they're really cheap and accessible. But it is about providing you with the nutrients. So, you know, there's different fatty acids, the minerals, the lignans um, that can help with estrogen levels, um, the fibers that help with your like bulking up your stool, feeding the gut microbiome. Um, that is really important. And people don't usually understand. I actually just made a TikTok video on this about you have to poop. And this is on my Instagram as well. But there are bacteria that live in your gut and they make an enzyme called beta glucuronidase. And if you've got dysbiosis, so imbalance, they'll make too much beta glucuronidase. What happens is your liver's like, I'm going to take this estrogen. You don't need this. You need to package it up and get it out. Then it will put it into your gut with bile to be carried out. But if those bacteria have that enzyme present, it will reconjugate or reactivate your estrogen. And now we've got estrogen dominance symptoms. This is where a supplement like calcium deglucurate can be really helpful. It's why we have it in our balance uh, women's hormone support supplement is because that supplement's about hitting phase one, phase two, and phase three estrogen detox. So that we, the estrogen we no longer need that can be problematic, we move out in an effective way. So that's the other thing about seed cycling that most people don't realize is that it's going to support your gut health and your gut health is absolutely essential to your hormonal health. Oh, 
Do we talk about the moon cycle and seed cycling? I was just going to ask if you don't mind. I would love to know more about the moon cycle and seed cycling. Yeah, because this is where women, especially postmenopausal or with like amenorrhea, like which just means you've lost your period. Um, they will say, well, how do I seed cycle? Where do I start with this? And so you follow the new moon as being day one of your period. So the new moon is the day that you have your period. This is you know, how we're matching it up. And the full moon is ovulation. And that's when you'll flip your seeds. And why it works that way is because when you go into like midwifery, like old midwifery texts, who are the like OGs of women's medicine, okay? Not not that Sims guy, which you guys go Google the ugly history of women's gynecology and you will be like, wow, I'm not surprised now we have so many issues in women's health. Like go back to the midwives. Those are the real OGs. And um, they made these observations just about cycling with the moon, which makes sense like from an ancestral perspective that if it was a full moon and like, what are you going to do? I say this in the book, like, what else are you going to do? You're living in a cave. <laughs> There's predators, like they're out on the full moon. Like you're, you're probably going to have sex. And what a time to ovulate if like this species, the human species wants to continue on. Like this is what would happen biologically speaking. And so that's why um, we follow it in that way. And I have had patients that are like, but I just got my period on the full moon. I'm like, after like seed cycling for a full few months and I'm like, then switch it. Just follow your body. Like this is just a starting place and then follow your body. Always honor the internal barometer. Oh, yes. And it's so empowering to hear you talk about this stuff as, as a woman. And I'm sure for my women listening, because it's just, it's just so good to understand how things work so that we can advocate on our own behalf so that we are, you know, basically armed with this really important information that is our birthright basically. Mm -hmm. Just so essential. Um, well, I mean, that's a really great point because once upon a time, your mom would have told you this because her, your grandmother told you this and there was this lineage and it was the current paradigm of medicine that stepped in and said no and actually made a bit of like their marketing around, what are you going to ask your grandma for help with this? Like, here we are. We're the experts. We know your body. And, you know, I think a lot, that's why, you know, there's two dedications in my book. And one of them is for the women who did go before us so that we could see there was another way because there are women who have gone through horrific things in women's health and have been subjected to uh, these horrible birth control clinical trials to, I mean, I, the list goes on. We could do a whole podcast on that. They went before us and if they hadn't, and they did suffer like we like we wouldn't be able to see where we are today and make those changes and we have to honor these women who have even made this possible and even the women who did advocate I mean, most people don't know that when birth control came out when feminine the feminist movement actually came out against it and said you you're poisoning women because of the way women felt and they were opposed to it um and then, you know, over time it became like, no, this is a woman's right. I'm like, somebody hire, I need that PR person. Like, <laughs> that, was like, yeah. that was well played. And yet when we did adopt birth control, we did begin graduating school at, at college at a higher rate. Our, our, how much we make in, in terms of our income went up. Like these positive things did happen. But we have to honor who came before us for us to even arrive at the place we are today, to even have the freedom for you and I to have this discussion. This conversation so openly, because even now, even today, little girls are ashamed of talking about their period. They're ashamed, mm -hmm. or ashamed of so many things about their bodies, but the period is one of the most stigmatized things about the woman's body. And it is actually the most miraculous, most amazing part yeah. of our cyclical bodies and our cyclical systems. And I feel like, you know, understanding this mystery, if we want to call it, we could just call it a woman's mystery, but we, we're going to demystify it by talking mm -hmm. about it, by owning it, by understanding how it works so that we are able to talk about it openly, not be afraid of it, not be ashamed of it. Very important for your mental health too, to Absolutely. feel like you are, you are in charge of your own body a hundred percent. 
So this is just so, you know, empowering to, to discuss. And, um, I think just another thing I just wanted to ask you about, because you were so generous in sharing about nutrition as it relates to how we can support ourselves through our cycle, um, whether we're mm -hmm. on the pill coming off of it, et cetera, just training. Cause I get a lot of women who ask me like, how should I be training throughout my period? Like I, you know, should I be changing how I exercise? And I'll tell you what I always tell them is I say, you know, you should listen to your body. And if you're feeling lower energy or you're feeling like, you know, you just, you want to like nest a little bit, do that. Maybe do some mm -hmm. yoga, maybe walk, do what supports your body. Um, don't feel like you have to go do heavy lifting that day. If that's on your schedule is, is that good guidance, Dr. Brighton? Oh, listen to your body is absolutely great guidance because, uh, so if anybody really wants to go deep on training and your menstrual cycle, Please. Dr. Stacy Sims is the, is the book to get roar. Um, she also has an Instagram account and she's done research and she is a competitive athlete. So I, I think she's done an excellent job just taking a deep dive in this and, um, what you'll find, and, and this has been my observation too with patients, is that, and, and my own body, leading up to your period, you do usually feel fatigued. That's not abnormal unless you can't like get out of bed. And um, <laughs> yeah, unless you're dragging out of bed, but it's not that abnormal. And you may want to pull back and you may want to focus on Pilates, yoga, um, maybe not weight but maybe body weight, or maybe you want to swim, uh, take it easy. Like that's okay to do. Maybe you're like, I just want to stretch. Totally fine. And then what we find, so there's this myth that your periods made you weaker. And because, uh, you know, that because of all these myths about women's health, when you go into the research, so we've got research is missing about birth control. Research is missing about women's health in general. But the researchers thought, let's eliminate the menstrual cycle from the equation and study female athletes and put them on birth control. Okay, like, I, you know, I was, I was doing my own research, like, you know, and uh, like, like legitimately designing research studies and doing research. And I'm like, all you did was introduce a new variable, a variable you don't understand, a variable we have no data on to actually understand. And so... Um, we don't know a whole lot. Like there's a little bit that we know, but a lot of these women were placed on birth control and then these studies were done. Then there's been small limited studies showing that birth control actually inhibits um, m like muscle mass gain. And so building muscle and performance and you'll see doctors dismiss that be like, oh, there's only a little bit of evidence. Yet there but if are. it impacts testosterone levels, how could it not have an impact? And women are not small men. Women, yeah. you know, I watched, oh my gosh, I've, I've seen some great TED Talks about this, but yeah. we are not small men, right? We are not, and most of the studies are done mm -hmm. on men when it comes yeah. to exercise and it's done, they're done on younger men who are mm -hmm. in the peak of their health. So you can't compare uh, a young man's uh, met metabolism, his hormone balance to a woman, say in perimenopause or a woman Absolutely. on the pill. So it's it, it's just like take the research with a grain of salt when it hasn't been done on someone who's experiencing yeah. what you're experiencing. What we found though, um, and I actually, you know, I had a friend make this observation and she's in research and um, she's like, you know, what I have seen happens with the with doctors especially gynecology is that they have made science their god and that god must not be questioned and that god is always right and it was just a really interesting perspective where she does a women's health research and she's like i see these gynecologists take the studies that we do and then they are like very flippant very dismissive of what women are saying and she's like and as a researcher i'm like oh that's interesting maybe we should research that but these gynecologists are like no shut it down not a thing if there's more research that comes out then we'll acknowledge you but until then no not a thing why are you even asking this question you don't really want my opinion because i'm going to tell you like it is like and i'm like why are you treating a human like that in general but like that's really poor bedside manner, but you'll see them play it out on social media. And I'm like, did I just see what I saw? Is that like happening in 2020? So, you know, I think this is why it comes back to, you have to honor your body. Yes. Um, what, you know, we have seen is that 
with the myth of the menstrual cycle is that it doesn't make you weaker. You can actually, so the uh, United States soccer team was the first team who actually synced up all their training with their menstrual cycles, didn't medicate their women on birth control, and instead said, we're going to work with your si- uh, cycles. And they kicked ass. Wow, like what a cool story. Yeah. And so what you understand is that with a lot of women, you, you pull back and it's actually, you know, your rest days are right before your period. When you're on your period, you actually can usually lift more, do more. Like the first day might be, if you're, especially if you have endometriosis, you're like bullshit. Like I'm in pain. Okay. I understand. <laughs> but like for most women, they'll actually be stronger, like going into that follicular phase when testosterone rises, they're lifting more. That's the time to make the gains, to push your body. So you can actually synchronize all of this with the menstrual cycle and have a competitive advantage. And this is something that a lot of us have been talking about for a long time. Maybe not a lot, like a few loud, uh, loud, loud, uh, you know, group of us. And yet the U S soccer team validated it. They put it into action and they validated it. And I'm like, why are we not talking about this? Why is this not being talked about more? It had a couple news articles and then everybody went back to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Women don't know their bodies. I'm like, that's Wow. Silly. Yeah. We're done with the dismissal basically. Yeah. And thank you for being a loud advocate of all of this. Thank you for not tuning it down. Dr. Brighton. It's really, oh, it's, that's it's what special. happens when you're a Latina. Like that is, <laughs> you're just, you're always like the loudest person in the room. <laughs> Yeah. And you, you went out, you've got, you've had, you have so much education. You've done so much independent research. You've been your own personal science experiment and used all of your knowledge to advocate for your patients. You are just an incredible powerhouse of wisdom and guidance to all of us. And I am so grateful for your book. I learned so much from reading it. I strongly recommend it to all of my listeners. And even if you're not on the pill, uh, there's a lot of really great information in that book about how your hormones work. I I love the whole liver detox protocol. I think a lot of us could benefit from the information about our gut health, Mm -hmm. our brain health. There was just so much valuable information. And just because you're not on the pill, maybe your sister is, or one of your friends is, and just just know this stuff, understanding how your body works. It's just so incredibly empowering. Um, I wish I had known it years and years ago, and I just want everyone to know it now. So before we go, I just want to give you the last word. Is there anything we didn't talk about, anything you want to bring up or talk about that I could let you speak to here? I think the most important thing is to listen to and advocate for your body and to recognize that you're the only one that knows what's normal for you. And so if you are saying this is not normal, that needs attention. Someone needs to ask why. And if somebody dismisses you and says, no, 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 that's just getting old or whatever rhetoric they want to spin, you need to find a new provider. You live in your body. You are the expert of what is normal. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure. I hope we get to have a follow-up conversation about this soon. And for all of my listeners, we will be linking to all of Dr. Brighton's resources, her book, her free e-guide, and her social media on the show notes page. And thank you so much for being a part of our conversation. And feel free to share this with a friend you think could benefit from it. Be sure to let me know any insights you got from listening today in the comments over on the show notes page at the bettyrocker.com backslash podcast. And coming up next week, we'll be taking a look at hormone health from a slightly different angle by focusing in on our muscle, truly the organ of longevity. We'll be talking to the doctor who created the concept of muscle centric medicine. Pretty cool, right? She's a brilliant MD and functional medicine practitioner who's actually my primary doctor, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. And I'm so excited to share her wisdom and knowledge knowledge with you. So until next time, my friend, I'm Betty Rocker and you are so awesome and amazing. I'll talk to you again real soon. This podcast is for information purposes only. Statements and views expressed on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Brie Argett Singer, Betty Rocker Inc. and the producers disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to 
to herein. Before starting a new exercise, fitness or health protocol, or if you think you have a medical problem, always consult a licensed physician.